I know we kind of touched base on some of the vulnerable communities, but who is at risk, like regardless of weight? Um, and is there like certain um, health factors or pre-existing conditions that you guys have noticed that have been most impacted? We have seen in our hospital a wide range of ages being infected. Um, and we have an older population coming from long-term care facilities that it's really affecting. We have certain um, skilled nursing facilities that have had outbreaks. So a lot of their residents are being admitted with it. Um, so unfortunately, they're usually a lot older, have a lot of comorbidities, um, and several are passing away from it. Um, a lot of the deaths that I've seen have been over like 85. Um, but then on the flip side, it's like we have people coming in in their 40s who have no comorbidities and they're having a really hard time breathing and they wind up getting transferred to a higher level of care um, while they're there. Um, I kind of my educated guess as to why that is is their immune systems are stronger so your body kind of goes into overdrive and starts attacking itself to hopefully attack the disease as well so it's causing a big inflammatory response um, especially in the younger population who don't have as many comorbidities so it's affecting a wide range of ages um, races, genders. So I haven't noticed as much like fat versus not. Um, but that's where the guessing game has really been for a lot of medical professionals is it's affecting so many different people. And then you see like 90 year olds walking out of the hospital that have overcome it and then people in their 40s on ventilators. So it's kind of a unique situation. Yeah, I definitely think that like, as Lauren was saying before, like most of the information that I've been hearing is like, if you do have a pre-existing condition that impacts your lungs or your breathing, then those are kind of like the pre-existing health conditions that are gonna be most affected by this. If they do contract the virus, it's going to be more difficult for people with lung issues and breathing issues already to be able to combat it. Is that true? Or is that kind of like the basic gist about kind of the people that are more at risk? Yeah. Def <laughs> Go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely. People with any sort of compromised lung is are definitely going to experience the um sorry i didn't mean to laugh there experience the worst uh case more than likely if they were to contract it uh same with your heart any 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 pre-existing condition that's going to affect your heart or lungs is going to be um make this extra difficult because you need both those things to well to live but also to breathe um the the thing that i think they're seeing like the most of having uh the more severe risk factors are people with like copd um asthma any any sort of lung issues but i think they're also saying hypertension is one that they're seeing a lot of if you have hypertension and you get coronavirus you're more than likely going to end up on a vent in the ICU. Um, so to sort of speak more to who is at the most at risk, like we're talking about anyone with comorbidities, anyone with these other conditions. Um, but as we're seeing, especially in cities like Detroit, New Orleans, um, New York, we're looking specifically at our black and brown communities um, that are having the most severe outcomes and that um you know there's the the real reason why is because of systemic racism that's what it is it's because their entire life is um dealing with you know all of the 
oppression, et cetera, that we put on them. There's a term called weathering. Um, it was originally uh, a theory that was applied specifically to black uh, women in their health that, you know, all of the socioeconomic stressors that they deal with, they have higher incidence of hypertension, of um, COPD, of different disorders that they really um, are citing with the fact that they didn't have income, they weren't able to um, get health care, basically preventative care, right? If we don't have access to preventative care, then we aren't able to stay healthy. That's a huge problem in our Native American indigenous communities. We don't have health care for them. It's a huge problem in our, in our um, black communities. So we are seeing, I think the data is showing that a lot more black and brown people are the ones that are dying. And it's because they don't have uh, good health care to begin with. And um, then when they are seeking health care, they're not getting the best health care as opposed to our white counterparts. So um, I do want to just kind of emphasize that, that those are definitely the ones, um, that's our communities that are getting affected the hardest. Yeah, I think um, Chicago came out with some information that was saying that um, I think the, the COVID infection rates infect the black and brown community at like a 26% rate, but of those people, they die at like a 70% rate, which is insane. And, and, you know, not only are these comorbidities because of systemic racism, but also because of just systemic stress, you know, it's, it's, you, you're stressed out from the day you're born, you know, and, and then I know it's further down on the questions, but we go and talk about Georgia because <laughs> I got some opinions. <laughs> um, like I said, I used to work there and um, good Lord, that's an unhealthy population. And it's 110% tied to the racial lines um and and even this well anyways we'll get into that <laughs> yes lauren stay fired up boo totally um and so we've been talking so much about the human population i want jazzy to jump in here our resident veterinarian and tell us a little bit about how this might be impacting our pets specifically maybe our cats. I know that um, it was just released that cats can um, contract coronavirus or COVID-19 specifically. And so can you give us a little more, can you enlighten us a little bit more about how this is impacting our pets? And uh, if you have any advice about uh, what pet owners should do if their pet does contract this virus. Yeah, so um, basically with pets in general, take the same precautions kind of that you're taking with everyone else that's not in your household. So um, quite a few people today have been saying the household is your safe space. You know, that everything in your house you've been touching this whole time when you're come from, you know, being outside, wash your hands and that's your space. So your pets have been in your space. That being said, don't take your dog hiking with you to go meet all the other dogs and then bring your dog back into your space because you probably didn't give your dog a bath. You probably let your dog go and sniff foo-foo over there too, you know, and go on the hiking trail. And I know everybody touched your dog Fifi because she's adorable and then you brought her back into your space, you know, so take your precautions. Um, specifically with cats, they FBRCP, is the feline distemper vaccine is what we call it and it vaccinates against the feline coronavirus. Coronavirus in cats is known to mutate. It causes feline infectious peritonitis, peritonitis FIP. It causes pneumonia and the cats have a really poor prognosis. So what are people with the coronavirus getting? A lot of pneumonia, breathing issues. It's the same family of viruses. Um, that being said, that's probably why the cats are more likely to house the virus in their system, but the data hasn't shown that the cats die specifically from that virus, if that makes sense. Their coronavirus may mutate. This coronavirus yet has not shown to mutate or to cause them death. So there's that too. I know some countries are going around 
euthanizing all of their cats and their dogs. Egypt, just straight out every stray that they see, euthanize, euthanize, euthanize. I'm gonna say that we probably shouldn't do that yet. Hopefully it never comes to that um, because the data is not there yet. We have to do a few more trials. We have to really see how far these pets go. Were they vaccinated against the coronavirus family at all? And then they passed from coronavirus, from COVID-19 or was it just in their system and it healed themselves, you know? Sometimes even we can get things that animals may pass to us, but we won't die from it because we're like the dead end host, you know? It won't um, mutate to us as much and it won't cause us the death that it might cause the horse, for example. Um, so, so can I or can I not pet a dog when I'm outside as long as they're six feet ahead? Okay, so you see that adorable little puppy poodle, and you cannot help yourself, I know. Um, I'm going to caution you against petting it. Its fur probably is not housing the virus. It's the owner that I'm concerned about. Is the owner wearing a mask? Is the owner over there coughing? Is the owner elderly? Because in that, you know, no, the virus is not living on their fur, but in that split second that you pet that pet, did the virus go and give it all the hugs and kisses in the world five minutes before? And that five minutes, I can't tell you what's going on. <laughs> okay, so note to self, stop petting strangers' dogs. Um, you know, it's a good idea anyway, just saying, you know, rabies, <laughs> vaccine, everything else, just saying. <laughs> Um, so that's an extra kind of measure that I'm going to need to add to my list um, of kind of things going out moving forward. But I'm really interested to kind of know um, me as like a, a fat, like a plus size fat woman. Are there any like extra measures that I have to undergo um, so that we can kind of help you? like my doctor or the nurse to give us the proper care to make things easier for you? Um, you know, is it necessary to kind of provide like all the background information to sort of um, humanize my body as just being a normal like human, like beyond like the fat woman that they see? I feel like um, when, when I'm in the doctor's office or if I'm a patient, I bring it up first, you know? So it's not the elephant in the room. It's like, y'all, I'm aware. Like, I know I'm a bigger person. But for me, for my own mental health, I needed to stop obsessing about my weight. And, you know, since then, I have become a healthier person because I don't hate myself, which is great, which is something that your doctor should want for you. And, you know, you're, yeah. So I, I feel like usually if I bring it up and if I say like, I'm aware, I know, like it's, it's, and, and, you know, whether I have to provide that backstory as to why I am the weight I am and why I've gained the weight because, because, you know, in my chart, you can tell like I've gained weight over time. And it's because at some point, I stopped obsessing about it. And, you know, now I say things like, you know, my goals are not based on weight because that's not healthy for my brain. My goals are based on fitness. My goals are based on tasks. My goals are based on, you know, cardiovascular health, stuff like that. So you kind of learn to advocate for yourself. And, you know, I think we, especially for what's going on right now and in lots of parts in Europe and the US especially, it's extremely hard to get tested. Um, are there any suggestions that you have in terms of advocating for like yourself that you have symptoms but you can't get tested? Or, you know, I'm calling my doctor and I'm saying this is happening and they're almost minimizing it um, and they're not kind of willing. Like, is, are there steps or is there something that I can be doing to kind of make sure I get the help that I need? But also suggestions with talking about 
on ways to talk to like family members about what could happen during me being sick as a fat person. Like how can we get them to either advocate for fat bodies um, or advocate for other people that we love in these situations? Because I think one of the hard things is it's especially hard to kind of ask for help and now during times when you you're almost too scared but you have to step up and i think having that knowledge or understanding of like what to say to make sure that you're being taken seriously is really important and i'll just jump in really quick and share kind of an example of that like recently my best friend told me that her brother-in-law was diagnosed with COVID-19 um, and he was in, you know, pretty critical condition. Um, he is a fat guy. Um, and so she was kind of going down the list of his symptoms and was saying that, you know, he has asthma, he has this and he has that, and then he's also fat. And I was like, oh, so is his fatness like a contributing factor? And she was basically like, well, you know, the doctors told him that it was, and a couple of my friends who were also nurses told me that it was, you know, and I was like, well, basically kind of explaining how obesity is used as this kind of like determining factor and how like his asthma has more to do with him getting, you know, the virus and being so sick because of contracting the virus versus his size. Um, and that was something that she hadn't even really thought of, but it's one of those things that it's like society puts the spin on it and automatically because you're fat, you, you know, you are going to have it and you're going to die from it. Can I just say one thing on that? Um, so, yeah, so I am also plus size, you know, and it's difficult when you're like the only plus size doctor in the hospital and in the other hospital, in the other hospital, in the other hospital. But um, more importantly, obesity, animals can become obese too, but they also get just about all the same diseases that humans do. And it's not linked the way that human healthcare links it to human patients. So. For me being for someone who's definitely off the BMI scale, you know, as far as my weight and my height goes, it doesn't make sense. And I will pose it to my doctor and I'll say, okay, yes, I have arthritis. Do you think it's because of my scoliosis or do you think it's because of my weight? Because in an animal, if an animal were overweight, I would say it's probably the scoliosis. It's probably your genetics and the way that your back goes like this versus just the fact that you should lose 20 pounds. So I think personally, I know it's like big brothers watching and it's all a conspiracy and stuff like that, but specifically with the way that America handles obesity and healthcare, I do think that there's a conspiracy or that <laughs> if you wanna call it that or that, there's this notion that for some reason, let's focus in on something physical that we can see versus really doing the work and figuring out what's going on behind what we can't see, what's actually going on in his or her body that's causing this. I can't see the asthma, but seeing as how COVID is connected to causing pneumonia is probably the asthma that caused it more than this person needs to lose 20 pounds. Like, yeah, okay, this is an arthritis that we're talking about, you know? So I just want to put that out there that veterinarians, we see y'all. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say, does anyone else want to jump in and, and share ways that we can advocate for ourselves in this kind of trying time? Yeah, I, I think um, advocating for yourself as a fat patient period is is something that's difficult and it's something that you have to get your own comfortable way of doing that there's probably a host of um you know websites that can kind of guide you in in different ways to approach it depending on your comfort level uh one thing that my therapist who's amazing and she's a eating uh disorder therapist and 
really recommend her. Um, she, I think it's eating disorder therapy, LA on Instagram, by the way, her Instagram account is awesome. But something that she always taught me was if you're advocating for yourself, especially when we're talking about like arthritis, like Jazzy was talking about, if your doctor says, well, gosh, I notice, you know, your knee is bad. It's arthritis. Losing weight's going to help that you push back and say, well, are you telling me that thin people don't get arthritis? then people don't have bad knees. So always finding what's most comfortable in a way for you to push back and advocate for yourself is, is the best thing. But for me, I found it was pushing back and saying, oh, so thin people don't get this either. And that kind of, well, uh, you know, that kind of puts them off their game a little bit and makes them have to think and, and talk to you a little bit more about it. Um, but as far as advocating for yourself in light of like coronavirus and being a fat patient, I, I don't think there's any tips we can give you as far as like how to get tested because they're not listening to you because so many people aren't getting tested. It doesn't matter your size or really the advice we would give you is be a billionaire because then you can get tested. Like you're, you know, it, unfortunately there just aren't tests. So, you know, you can advocate till you're blue in the face, but unless you're rich, I don't know the likeliness of you getting it. Um, each state in, in the United States, their testing is different um, based on the access that they have to it. So I think, you know, we're very fortunate in California where our, our government is really looking out for us and working with science as opposed to working with the federal government or, you know, other people who don't believe in science. So we, like I get text messages about, do you think you have coronavirus symptoms? Click here and it takes me to the public health website and walks me through, like, if you have X, Y, and Z, call this person. If you are experiencing this, call this. So it, it again, totally varies from place to place what your access to testing is. And it really doesn't matter whether you're, you're fat or not. It, it comes down to what the, the facility actually has to offer. Um, I, I just wanted to chime in cause I, I've had, a. a two personal experiences with testing. Um, one, my dad, I am quite sure had it. Um, and you cannot convince me he didn't until his antibodies are negative. Um, and it was very frustrating because he's in the high risk population. He's 68 years old. Um, doesn't have any, um, well, he's pre-diabetic, but that's the only comorbidity and obstructive sleep apnea. So the when we call, you know, I have, of course was like, call your doctor. These symptoms are weird. And, and so he called and basically his doctor, this is Kaiser. I have my opinions about Kaiser too. Um, but basically his doctor was like, you don't have enough distressing respiratory symptoms to get a test. And so basically what I've been saying and what I've heard other uh, doctors and healthcare providers say is if you have suspicious symptoms, assume you have it. And as far as getting a test, like a test isn't really going to change whether or not you're going to get care if all of a sudden you're having difficulty breathing or all of a sudden your fever spikes, you know, above 103. Like you need care no matter what you have at that point. But before that, assume you have it restrict your movements, quarantine the crap out of yourself so you don't give it to anybody else. But um, that's, that's kind of the unfortunate reality is that you're not really going to be able to know if you had it because unless you have those severe symptoms, they're not going to test you. On the flip side of that, I personally was tested a few weeks ago because I had been sheltering in place with my parents and like the day after I left to go back to work, my dad started exhibiting these symptoms. And, you know, I, I we tried to get him to get a test from his doctor, because obviously he was the one that was actively experiencing symptoms. But as I was going to work, and I'm working as someone who's screening, I got really nervous because I'm looking at these questions. And basically the only reason I'm passing this screening is because my dad was not a confirmed case. And if he was a confirmed case, I wouldn't be cleared to go to work. 
And so I called my occupational health and said, you know, this is the scenario. My dad has this, 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 and this symptom. I'm really concerned he has it, but they won't test him. And so I don't know if I've been exposed and I don't want to be a typhoid Mary situation of coming into work and potentially infecting other people. And, you know, I said, I have normal allergy symptoms. And so it's really hard for me to tell if I'm having any other sort of symptoms. And so they said, you know what, I think it's better for your state of mind and for everybody's safety that you do get tested. And so I did. And fortunately it was negative, but, um, it's still just really, really complicated. And another thing kind of going off of that, as far as testing, I think is we've had patients on our unit um, that were testing or waiting for the results. We swear up and down that they're positive and the test comes back negative. So a lot of our infectious disease doctors have been keeping them on that unit because they say, well, they're exhibiting all of the, like all the labs that they're looking at looks like, cause there are certain like liver enzymes that have been really off on people. Um, their symptoms are indicating this, but their viral load is just not high enough for the test to detect. So it's like, we had a patient who had like two negative tests, like a, several days apart. And the infectious disease doctor's like, we don't know why he's still testing negative because like the patient wound up being transferred to a higher level. And it's not a hundred percent guaranteed tests because like in any test there's false positives, there's false negatives. So it's pinpointing like what test is going to be the most accurate so that more people can be tested so that we can lift these shelter in place orders hopefully sooner rather than later, but we wanna extend it as long as we have to to protect as many people as possible. So it's really tricky. There's no finite answer on testing, um, but if you think you have it and you're not needing medical care, just stay home. <laughs> protect everybody else. That's the best advice we can give you. Speaking of lifting the shelter in place orders, um, I want to get into what's going on in Georgia. I'm sure you ladies have heard about them uh, planning on lifting the shelter in place on Wednesday, which is tomorrow. Um, what do you think about that? Um, and also there's been a lot of discussion specifically in Georgia about like this peak passing and now this whole like elusive peak thing is something people are talking about like, oh, the peak has already passed or the peak is coming up. Um, can you break down what the peak is and share with me what you think about um, Georgia being one of the first few states to uh, lift the shelter in place? I know there are a few states who never went into shelter in place either. So just your thoughts on that. I can explain the peak is in terms of what I understand it as, and that's what your state has as far as case numbers that are coming in um, in correlation with your resources. So I think for California, the peak date was um, earlier. Um, how many ventilators were needed? how many ICU beds were needed. And so it's like whether or not we might like have a higher peak again, it's, it's just so unknown and it varies by state, it varies by county. So I don't know, I haven't actually heard much on Georgia specifically because I honestly am trying to avoid the news because it's so hyped up in certain cases that I can't mentally process all of it. So it's just, it's gonna take time, it's gonna take research on what is gonna be the most effective to save the most lives. Um, uh, Georgia, sorry, I get really angry about it. Um, first and foremost, states that did not implement 
stay at home measures. That's bananas bonkers to me. States that are lifting their stay at home measures now also bananas bonkers. Uh, again, I just want to push our awesome government in California. We were the first to shut down. We were the first to initiate the stay at home measures. And we are also um, have a government that keeps saying over and over again, they're, they're going to be working with science and nothing else. They're listening to the scientists and the doctors. Um, so just a little bit more about the peak when we're talking, it's weird because we keep talking about the peak, but I think there's different peaks really that people are referring to. Um, when it comes to epidemiology, the peak is just really the highest number of cases period. And then it, when it comes down um, is supposed to be, you know, when people are starting to recover. That is hard for us to figure out here, right? Because not only do we not have enough testing, so we don't know truly who has it, who doesn't. Um, but then there's also the peaks like Kendra was talking about where each, each area is gonna have a different peak because of when the infections hit that area. Um, so for instance, Georgia saying that they already hit their peak, I don't understand how they've determined this, um, especially when they didn't have access to testing. And also, um, I think he was, the, it was the same governor that when he did put in the stay at home orders, he said it was because he didn't realize that people could be walking around infected when they didn't have symptoms, which we've known that since the beginning, China has been telling us that since the beginning. So that whole state is just a hot mess of just awfulness. Uh, same with Florida. It's bad. And then you get states like Michigan where the governor is doing the best that she can and you've got, you know, racist right wing bullshit of people protesting the stay at home orders. Um, so I, I don't know that we can answer for sure, like when the peak is or when it's going to hit your exact area. The best thing, you know, is to look at your local news, your CDC. And when I say local news, I don't mean like Fox or Breitbart. I mean, like, you know, uh, if you're in LA, you would look at the LA times, you know, um, that being said, I think CDC, uh, the WHO website, you know, those are good places to go and get updates of what's going on with the current status of, uh, of the virus. But again, I would caution anybody who lives in states that are re lifting those orders. I would say if you are not required to go to work, if your job isn't making you go to work, don't go out. Don't like continue to quarantine, continue to stay at home, um, act as if those orders weren't lifted because unfortunately you're in a situation where your government isn't being smart and they're not taking care of their people. So I have two things to say on this subject. Um, uh, like I said, I used to live there, so uh, it's um, close, near and dear to my heart. Um, and as far as yeah, you know, we're talking about this peak. The incubation period is also supposedly 14 days, hopefully. Um, and Georgia hasn't even been on lockdown for 14 days. So, yeah. So, like, you know, you're talking about this peak and, like, okay, the idea is, so, theoretically, if everybody went in their houses 14 days ago, then it has not been transmitted since then, theoretically. But that hasn't happened and so you're letting people back out now and so you're talking about this peak has gone by but you're not going to know that because it's still being transmitted you haven't shut it down yet so it's insanity the man is a moron um and it's uh if you're talking about uh some place to believe in conspiracies good lord george is a good place to start because this is the governor who was also involved in a really sketchy election um, where, uh, you know, polling places in poor black communities were not working. And at that point, he was employed as the secretary of state who is in charge of voting polls, polling places. So again, this is why you don't let people get away with stealing elections because then you have a moron in charge. Two, 
I don't even know. I'm so, mm -hmm, I don't even know what my second part was. I can't remember now. <laughs> I'm so upset. Um, oh, 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 I remember. Um, so the other part of this is that, again, this is kind of more on the conspiracy side of things, but the businesses that they're opening, if you're talking about restarting the community or the economy, you would think theoretically you want to open the businesses that would be most lucrative for the economy. Those are not the businesses that are being opened. The businesses that are being opened are hair salons, barbershops, massage, you know, uh, gyms, uh, massage therapy places, estheticians. These are jobs that are typically people in lower income who are barely making a living wage work. And two, one percenters, you know, people that have money to blow use those services. And so you're talking about a, a population of people that have the privilege of staying inside and avoiding this even longer. And then all of a sudden you're making these jobs where people can file for unemployment because there was a shelter in place. Now they're making it so you can't file for unemployment because you're not technically unemployed because the state said you can go to work. So you're exposing an entire already vulnerable population to this virus again. So um, yeah, someone mentioned eugenics earlier. You know, it's scary. I know I'm not a medical professional, but it makes me feel so upset and like scared because as an American like who lives abroad watching it from the news like it's and my whole family lives there and they're all high risk like they're every single one of them even you know I have a cousin who doesn't have a spleen so you know it's 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 scary seeing when you're watching government misbehaving and you know I am intrigued, and intrigue is not the right word, but I think especially seeing kind of those protest pictures, you know, in Colorado with like the nurses and the protesters, like that's, that's a picture, that's an image that will stick with me for the rest of my life. And it kind of, I think, explains everything. And also it's the appreciation that I have for every single one of you guys who have joined in on this call. You know, when I like messaged Annette in like the middle of the night for me because I was so anxious kind of about all these articles that were happening because it was when one researcher kind of said obesity, coronavirus, and the media just went with it. And it like made me scared. So this conversation has really helped me and I know it will have helped a lot of our community. And I think I want to know what are some ways like important and impactful ways that I can kind of help the medical community right now, because, you know, in the UK, it's little things, but every Thursday at 8 PM, everyone goes outside or like opens their window and they clap and they cheer. And, you know, small businesses are giving meals, but are there any specific things that we should be doing to support you guys? Stay home. Yeah. Stay home, stay home, stay home. <laughs> Wash your hands, stay home. Don't get sick. That's the biggest number one thing you can do for all of us. We don't want to have to see you in the hospital. We don't want to have to take care of you. And I think... Um, the, you know, the cheering and the singing and all those things that we see in the news, it is lovely and super heartwarming. Um, and also nurses love free food. So yeah, free food's always cool too. But really, I think every single one of us would just echo, we just want everybody to stay home. And especially when you're in states like we talked about where they're lifting the order, if you do not need to go out, don't go out, keep staying home. This is not over. We don't have a treatment, we don't have a vaccine, and I can tell you that because I'm working on all the clinical trials for it, and it just, it, it's going to be a long haul, and being patient and 
with everyone, which I know is really hard when we're all losing our minds living in this situation, but being patient and uh, staying home is what I would ask for sure. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah, obviously stay home. Um, again, the, the, the cheers are lovely. The thank yous are lovely. Um, the free food is excellent. Um, but it's more lately has been really pissing me off with the combined, you know, contrast of these people trying to violate shelter in place orders and trying to, you know, bully their government into opening the state back up or even government that is just doing whatever the hell they want. So thank you for the thank yous. Thank you for the cheers. But one, stay home, listen to science, please listen to science. Don't spread misinformation. Try and educate yourself. I know it's super overwhelming to hear all of this information and it feels like it changes hourly, but please try and keep yourself educated. Keep your community educated. If you see someone spreading in, in misinformation, try and stop them. Try and have a dialogue. And then finally, when this is all finally over, I want some freaking legislation because this cannot happen again. We cannot allow this situation to happen. We cannot allow all of these people to become unemployed. We cannot allow to have such a fragile system where one disaster completely derails everything. And um, nurse ratios, please, nationwide, <laughs> that too. <laughs> Yeah, well, going off of those two women, um, I'll obviously stay home. But one of the most infuriating things for me is the longer that people are fighting it and going out and not following what they're supposed to, the longer we're going to have to do it. So it's really counterintuitive to keep fighting it. It's like if we could all just follow the rules um hospitals like they're losing a ton of money to even be able to take care of these patients because we're postponing all of these elective surgeries that are making the hospitals money which is a whole nother conversation but um just that fact so many nurses so many healthcare workers are out of jobs as well um a lot of travel contracts are being canceled i worry every day that my extension of my contract's not going to go through. Thankfully, I have like a good little nest egg, but not everybody has that privilege. So it's like the longer we fight, the longer the people are out protesting. The fact that nurses are having to protest on their days off or if they're unemployed, they're out protesting. It's like they are putting themselves at risk even more. So it's like they're at risk at work, they're at risk everywhere they go. So it's taking a toll on the medical community, obviously. So all the Karens need to stay home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Karens, stay home. Well, before we wrap this up, I have one final question for all of you ladies. Um, <clears throat> try to kind of end it on a positive note. But I wanted to ask you, what's one rose and one thorn? Maybe start with the thorn and end with the rose. And basically that means like one negative thing and one positive thing that you've gotten from this whole experience of isolating, quarantine, and like being on the front lines and working through this pandemic. I can start. Um, one thorn would be... I'm so like you women as well, you love to travel. Um, that's just like the core of who I am. That's why I'm a travel nurse. I love to experience different cultures and just broaden my horizons and not being able to just get on a flight and leave like I can normally do or get in my car and do a big road trip. That's been one of the biggest thorns for me and being away from family during all of this has been hard as well. Um, but my rose would be the fact that I am in a place where my teamwork at 
the hospital is fantastic. Uh, my coworkers, we're all just there for each other and it's been really nice. And then just the family and friends that have been reaching out, sending me N95 masks that they happen to have because they work in paint supply or they're farmers. Um, so I'm able to donate those. Um, it's just been really nice to see that support from family and friends as well. Um, for me, the thorn is <clears throat> just seeing the continuance of uh, bad government and bad news causing just heaps of misinformation and people not able to properly care for themselves because they're given the wrong information. So um, it's just a bigger uh, sort of exclamation point on my, my hatred of our current federal administration. So that would definitely be the thorn. Um, and the positive rose of it all is um, the online community, like I think y'all probably can agree with this, but I mean, we're all forced to um, stay at home, which means strengthening our online presence. <laughs> uh, I've had many, you know, I, my fiance and I celebrated our birthdays during this. So that was done via Zoom. <laughs> and I think, um, yeah, just the relationships and, and things that are sort of fostering out of this because we're all living in such a traumatic experience that we can all relate and being able to do so online has been pretty awesome. Um, I definitely offshoot of that, that um, I think my thorn is, um, you know, I, I'm a little annoyed with myself that I, I really thought that there was going to be a breaking point that maybe people, maybe our, our leaders would actually get it together and actually give a crap about us. And, uh, the thorn is that that just seems to not be the case. And that's very disheartening and, um, frightening. Um, but the rose is the immense capacity for people, regular people, to care and to help each other out. And, um, you know, we, I, I have people talking about local, local businesses, how to help out your local business, how to, um, you know, share, share supplies and share funds and people posting where they can find toilet paper and, you know, all sorts of things. And then, you know, on as an extreme, um, the coworkers I have and the family that I have, most of my family is in healthcare. My cousin is in New York right now. She's an ICU nurse. She took a travel contract there instead of going to Seattle. And um, just the immense capacity for these people to, to risk their lives and try and help each other, even though this situation just seems so dire. So that um, regular people are giving me hope. So, Jazzy, do you want to go? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I guess for me, the thorn would probably be, um, I think, just the fact that people, they're paying a bit too much attention to the news, maybe, or to their the, the internet. I'm not sure, but they're not taking it very seriously. Um, so it's putting a lot of people at risk. You know, I have to fight with my clients to ask them to wear a mask, like, please wear a mask, you know, just so that I don't expose you and you don't expose me. And the fact that, you know, they think, well, it's no big deal, you know, um, my, my family takes it seriously, but not my friends, you know, a lot of partying still going on, um, a lot of gatherings still going on. And so I think it's just going to take a long time for us as a nation to get over this just because I know a lot of people aren't taking it as seriously as they could. But the rose part of that is um, 
I think that for the people, you know, in general, we all do have to stay home. So I think it's making people, you know, sit down and talk with their families and have family dinners and, you know, get closer to your loved ones and get closer to your pets, particularly since I'm, you know, animals are my world, but people are paying attention. They're like, I think Fifi should be on some medication for her heart disease. I said, well, thank you. I, I agree. I, I love it, you know? So I think people are paying more attention to the beings around them that they just ignore in their day-to-day and the busyness that we have in and out of life. And I do love that togetherness that they're creating amongst themselves. So it's my rose. Amanda, do you have any uh, rose or thorn that you want to share? Ooh, I didn't think this applied to me. Um, I think my thorn is very much figuring out, you know, my new normal and it and dealing with kind of when to the plethora of information that's like coming out there and figuring out because I think um, it's really hard when to to be reading and seeing things and it's hard to almost turn it off and I think it's really disheartening when you see people not doing what they're doing and I think one of the hard like it flabbergasts me that I talk with people back in America and they just aren't taking it as seriously as I am or and and I think that's been really hard like I had to call my grandma and basically like beg her to stay inside and I was like I'm not going outside so that I don't kill someone's grandma like I don't need you to go outside so someone else can accidentally kill you like please just stop so I think that's kind of been my biggest thorn is like figuring this space out with my mental health and like what I should and shouldn't be doing. My rose has also been, it's kind of, it's taking that step back and reevaluating the things that are important to me and spending time on. So it's a, a strange feeling to be sharing the same emotions with the whole world. Like it's, we're all going through it. And I think that's, there's something oddly beautiful and sad about that, that we're all experiencing all these different emotions through different points of our weeks and days. So I think um, the connections that I'm making with the people who I'm having conversations with are much deeper because we're at a common place of kind of understanding each other a bit more than maybe we would have been before. So I think that's really my, my rose. Um, that and I'm cooking a lot more. And like, I'm cooking pretty well. But what about you, Annette? What's your thorn and rose? I would say that one of my thorns, there's a few thorns, but I would say like the most impactful one right now is kind of just the fact that I've had to like cancel fat camp and, you know, just kind of put my you know, personal life and professional life on hold. Most of you ladies here, I've met you because of like fat camp or different like fat girls traveling events. So it's kind of a bummer to not only have to cancel that, but to not really know like when we'll be able to connect again in real life. But I would say that the roads to all of this is kind of being able to have the opportunity to connect virtually and to have the time and the space and the creativity to come up with ways like this conversation to be able to spread information, to educate each other and to empower each other. And so I think those are my rose and thorn. And yeah, I just basically wanna thank you ladies so much for your time. I know this ran a little bit longer than we originally thought. So thank you all for staying in there and if there's anything else you want to say before you leave also just let the audience know like where they can follow you on social media and all that kind of stuff uh yeah so the thing i want to say is just again stay inside wash your hands don't need to wear gloves and um my name is jordan but you can follow me on 
uh, all of social media at nurse murderer, all one word. Thanks. And thank you, Annette, for arranging this. I think this was awesome. Um, I'm not really huge on social media, but I've got like a travel RN Kendra account on Instagram if you want to follow me there. But this was really informative for me as well. Um, and it was nice to chat with you lovely ladies. And thanks for getting together and taking your time, you guys. Yeah, I want to say thanks also uh, for organizing this. This has been really great to hear um, other people's perspectives and professionally what they're experiencing and privately how, what they're experiencing. Um, so thank you again. And um, yes, keep washing your hands. Keep staying inside. Keep listening to science, please. Um, I, you can follow me on Instagram at LB underscore tripping again. And that's me. Thanks. So uh, thanks everyone for listening. I'm really bad at social, social media. So I have an Instagram that I haven't updated in like five years. It has like a picture of me and a horse on it. Um, my Facebook also is not really up to date, but um, I do work with Banfield. It's one of the largest veterinary hospitals in the nation. So go to your vet if you have questions, please wear your mask um, and support, please support our human medical professionals because if they call the vets in i promise you i'm gonna put a muzzle on you you're gonna go in the crate and we're not gonna have any of this okay so <laughs> just continue to support them and i think this was lovely i learned so much from all of you wonderful nurses you guys really educated me and i'm gonna pass it on and thank you um annette and amanda for hosting this i think it was great bye yeah, thank you guys again. Like, I know I feel a lot more um, better about the whole thing. You know, I'm a firm believer in knowledge is power. And um, it, it, I'm literally going to go to bed after this. So it, I will, I'm not even exaggerating when I say I'm going to sleep a lot easier tonight because of, of this conversation, um, because I will. <laughs> and so yeah, thanks Annette for arranging and thank you guys. Any last words, Annette? Yeah, I just want to thank all of you ladies for your time and your energy. And um, this was super helpful to me and I can't wait to share it with our audience. I hope you have a great day or night wherever you are in the world. Bye.